Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order for the afternoon of November 8th, 2022. And uh, Tony, can you please do a roll call? Jimenez? Present. Perales? Cohen? Here. Crosco? Here. Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? You have a quorum. Thank you. And I'll make a commitment to my colleagues that I will have all of you out of here before 9 p.m. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Now, if we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. By the music program director and owner of SJC, uh, SJG School of North. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor to introduce Chris Shaheen, who will lead today's invocation to begin our meeting. For over 30 years, Chris has been a music teacher, composer, and guitarist in the San Jose area. Chris grew up listening to and rocking out to classic rock, but always had a love for jazz and, and instrumental music. He is the founder and owner of the San Jose Guitar School of Music and is accompanied today by Jason Lewis on drums and Ken Okada on bass two major players in the San Jose creative music scene. Chris will play his original song titled New Song for San Jose, which he dedicates to the city of San Jose for welcoming him and his extended immigrant family. This song is inspired by the sounds of the early people of California through the Spanish guitar and a waltz bridge as a tribute to the Mexican heritage of San Jose. Without further ado, I welcome Chris Shaheen to say a few words on our council stage before performing Canción Nueva de San Jose, his new song for San Jose. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me today. Glad to perform on this great election day in this great city, in this great country. I dedicate this song to uh, the city of San Jose. It's called New Song for San Jose. And I want it to replace the other San Jose song because... I think everybody knows the way to San Jose now, right? We everybody, it's, the word is out. So no further ado, here we go.
that, that, was, that was awesome. I think I'm going to defer all the other items on our agenda and, and just have you do a full concert. How, how does that sound? Yeah. That was amazing. Thank you. So I'm going to um, ask Council Member Mahan to please join me at the podium, and we will recognize and commend the U.S. Youth Men's Beach Handball National Team. All right. Hello again. It's a pleasure to welcome the U.S. Youth Men's Beach Handball National Team and their coach, Martin Bellelo, here today to recognize and commend them for their recent achievement at the IHF Men's and Women's Youth Under-18 Beach Handball World Championships that took place in Greece this year. Not a bad destination, guys. The history of beach handball started in the 1980s in Italy after beach volleyball began to thrive on Italy's beaches and inspired the country's handball players to transfer the game to the sand. In the history of the IHF Youth World Championship, this was the first time that the U.S. participated in this tournament. Not only did this team compete with the best in the world, but they secured the United States' first victory in a match in the history of the tournament as well. Congratulations on your hard work and well-earned victory in Greece. And I have to note, I, I believe Coach Martin Bolelo brought this sport to the U.S. Is this uh, for youth we're sports? Start, we're starting to have beach days. Starting. Excellent. And I'm going to make sure you say a few words in a moment. Thank you so much. I want to recognize all the players from District 10 here. Pioneer High School, we have Paulo Barr Gutierrez, Ian Hodgson, Ezekiel McClintock, Aaron Wolf Bloom, and Kale Krogan. And from Leland High School, AJ Bulo, did I screw that up? Sorry about that. Colby Condit, Oliver Goodall, Alexander Lee, and Andrew Constant. And of course, again, their coach, Martin Bolelo. Join me in giving these young men a big round of applause. <laughs> coach, do you want to say a few words? Uh, it, it was an honor to represent the US, I think, for all of them as well. Uh, it was like uh, uh, Councilman here say uh, it was the first time that the U.S. participated, and like 90% of the team was from San Jose. Uh, kids that started playing uh, when they were in middle school in Castellero, Bret Hart, and now in high school they're representing their country. So hopefully we can keep growing the sport uh, in San Jose and, and in the entire Bay Area with the support of the community and uh, the authorities here as well. Uh, hopefully we can do that and grow the sport at all, uh, uh, completely in the, in the U.S. as well. Since we're looking forward to uh, this sport to become an Olympic sport and to represent the U.S. at the LA Games uh, with, in 2028 with Team Humble as well. So, thank you. So Councilmember Mayhan is going to stay here because um, we are going to recognize Rich Saito and Councilmember Mayhan. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Don't know how I ended up with two commendations on one day, but this is a very exciting one. Rich, please come on down or over. I'm really excited to present this next commendation to Rich Saito. He's a community hero, I don't think it's, it's, it's saying too much to, to call him that, to, who has contributed so much to the lives of the many people he has come across here in San Jose. Every single person my staff reached out to attested to his huge and positive impact on our community. 
Rich's career and community accomplishments are not easily summed up as he is a man who has worn many hats. First, he had a long and distinguished career in the San Jose Police Department, starting as a volunteer with the SJPD Reserve in 1975 and then serving as a sworn officer for roughly three decades before retiring as lieutenant in 2006. When Rich turned 70 in 2021, he became a senior reserve officer and has actively served in the reserve unit through various non-enforcement activities, including attending meetings for the reserve command staff, where he assists by taking meeting notes and has never shown up without a box of cookies. In 2013, he received his amateur radio license and joined San Jose's Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Services. He's played an instrumental role in the founding of Community Emergency Response Teams, also known as CERT, starting with Japantown Prepared. Since then, over 900 San Jose residents and neighborhoods across the city have completed their CERT training. As a board member and docent at the Japanese American Museum in San Jose, he organized and trained individuals in the Stop the Hate Foot Patrol program in Japantown to address resident concerns about growing violence against the AAPI community. Rich has also provided invaluable support for community events like the 4th of July Fireworks Festival at Almaden Lake, Viva Calle in Japantown, and National Night Out. Today, he is still working just as hard as a civilian as he did when he was an officer. In the words of his family and friends, Rich is a doting grandfather, the cool old guy, a volunteer extraordinaire, and a pillar of the community. It's truly a joy and honor to stand here today alongside, well, we want to welcome Rich's supporters. Clearly, I didn't take the cue from my talking points here. Rich's supporters, if you want to come down to, to stand behind us here to acknowledge his dedication to public safety, disaster preparedness, and instilling in residents Taske Ao, also known as the spirit of community service and helping each other. I've only scratched the surface of what could be said about this great man. Please join me in giving Rich Saito a big round of applause. And for all of Rich's friends, family, colleagues, anyone who wants to come down for the photo, we're going to have Rich say a few words before the vice mayor presents him with this commendation. I uh, want to invite everybody to come down and be part of the, the photo. Rich, it's all yours. Wow, this is overwhelming. <laughs> oh no, El Jefe. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Council Member Mayhem, Vice Mayor Chappie, uh, City Council members, and friends of San Jose. Um, I'm deeply honored to be here. I wasn't expecting this. Uh, when Michelle called me up and said that I was going to get accommodation, I thought, me? I haven't done anything. And I, I'm motivated for two basic groups. And, and one is, of course, my family, my wife, Diane pretty in pink, uh, and our three sons, Dave, Paul, Chris, their spouses, uh, Andrea, Emily, and Kate, and of course my five grandkids. One of the reasons why I do all this is because I want to make the world better for my grandkids. Uh, so we have uh, Caroline, Jack, Elliot, Lily Mae, and Wally up in Portland, and I'm working to get them brought down here. Uh, in Japantown, uh, I'm honored to serve on a CERT team with Jim McClure and Jeffrey Oldham, uh, Kelvin Kamachi, John Pocock, who actually lives in Mountain View, and Vanessa Takeyama. At the museum, I'm inspired by uh, Joyce Yamamoto and uh, Michael Serra, Vanessa Hatakeyama again, and Chris Hioki, who's standing back here. Uh, in Japantown, uh, I'm on the Japantown Community Congress, and I'm inspired by Pam Yoshida. That woman is amazing. Uh, she has such creativity and such energy. Uh, the other District 10, or I'm sorry, District 3 groups would include uh, 
Jeff Hare from Negley Park, Jeff Levine from Roosevelt, and Mary Tucker from uh, Hensley Historical District. Each one of those individuals is just a, an amazing contributor to public safety for their neighborhoods. So I'm inspired to follow in your footsteps. Uh, for the rest of the council districts in, in D10, there's the Almaden Valley uh, CERT, there's Los Paseos CERT, and of course, citywide, there's the San Jose Neighborhood CERT, uh, started by Herb Bowen, who's back here, uh, Lee Steckmest, and Cole Cameron, and a bunch of other people. Uh, going out citywide, uh, I'm honored to serve and am uh, inspired by uh, the RACES group, which Council Member Mayhem already already mentioned, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service, and uh, of course, uh, RACES, which is, oh, no, I'm sorry, RACES, I already said, uh, there's the San Jose Neighborhood CERT, and then on the county level, there's CADRE, the Collaborating Agencies Disaster Relief Effort. These are 80 organizations who have committed to serve the city in the event of a disaster, and, because our public safety services are going to be uh, a little overwhelmed. So, again, my family and serving the community, uh, this is what drives me. And I, Again, I was very surprised to see this, and I want to thank all of you for your support. Uh, the last one, of course, is the police department. Uh, I'm one of the few individuals who has been very lucky to enjoy my job every day for 45 years. And I thank all of the command staff, Chief Mata, uh, Brian Shab. Uh, I have two ca captains, but the, the main one's been Car Carlos Acosta. And they've been very supportive to help, help me s provide services to the city. And the last one is my direct supervisor. <laughs> one more I just remembered. Uh, if you go to Fifth and Jackson, uh, you're going to get a great cup of coffee <laughs> at Roy Station, and it's run by the Rast family, <laughs> Carol and <laughs> Jasmine. And then in Japantown, the mayor of Japantown is Tamiko, <laughs> and I serve her. So this family does an amazing job. Frank sweeps the streets every day when he's able to. Uh, Carol is the mother of the community. Uh, Jasmine and Tomiko are the, the people who make things go. They're, they actually run things. And then there's Heather, Crystal, uh, Miles, Daniel, and of course I was hoping to see uh, Nalani and Ayla. But maybe next time. Now, oh, yeah, we also have uh, Jen Masuda from UI Kai. Uh, we're very fortunate to have a senior services uh, social agency that does a great job taking care of our seniors. So, all right, that'll do it. Yeah, I'm in. Well, I don't know if I was in, but I was here. I was here. No, but I'm I know you're you tower over. <laughs> um, Council Member Carrasco is joining me as we rec uh, recognize and commend someone who actually I look to for advice and input 
and, and that is Jesus Flores. Councilman Crosby. Until everybody quiets down. Okay. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone, and blessings to all of you on this very rainy day. What a beautiful day for an election. Just want to remind everybody I went out to vote. Make sure your friends and family do the same. As I wrap up my term after eight years, I've been reflecting on all the wonderful individuals who have been part of my journey. And my council colleagues know this uh, as well as I do, that this is not an easy job. You need partners that are willing to work with you. And today I want to take the time to highlight Jesus Flores, who's been an incredible ally and an asset, not just to my office, uh, but to the entire city of San Jose. Jesus has been here many times before in different capacities. He's been here uh, recognized for his work with other organizations and contributing to the success of initiatives like the Small Business, Small Business Saturday. Jesus is truly an accomplished individual, worthy of recognition. And I'm very glad, I'm so sorry, Jesus, that I haven't, I haven't taken the time to do this earlier, but I'm so glad that you're here because uh, uh, I, I really do think that we need to highlight the work that you do, the work that so many other people do to keep our city uh, safe. Jesus Flores is president and CEO of the Latino Business Foundation of Silicon Valley, or LBF, an organization that supports over 1,600 small businesses in our region. I'm going to repeat that, Vice Mayor, 1,600 small businesses in our region alone. The LBF provides technical support training and advocacy to small and micro businesses in Silicon Valley. Among his numerous recognitions, uh, he's been recognized by the California State Senate, the California State Assembly, the City of San Jose, and he was one of our honorees in the 2022 Community Honoree Awards. And throughout the pandemic, the Latino Business Foundation was instrumental in ensuring resource alignment, supporting through technical advice, and securing capital so that our small businesses, so that our small business community could pivot and remain afloat. Through their service and advocacy, they've empowered countless small minority and women-owned businesses, equipping them with the tools and the confidence to persevere and become leaders in the business community. They operate all these programs to members with no membership or service charge. Simply put, they recognize that when one business thrives, all businesses thrive. And in fact, their impact is compounded as he is now a permanent resident at La Esquinita, uh, which is in the Quetzal Gardens uh, building. Jesus and the LBF team are taking that spirit of entrepreneurship and developing it even further, supported by both Excite Credit Union and Somos Mayfair. Jesus revived a defunct business association that had been dormant for over 10 years and serving as president of the Alam Rock Business Association until August of 2020. He breathed new life into this association as a response to the bus rapid transit construction project. As you know, I've talked about it uh, at nauseum, but this created a chaos that many businesses were unable to maneuver through. And in fact, 50 of our businesses, locally family-owned businesses, close their doors forever. I attribute Jesus Flores as being part of the vanguard that made sure that it was only 50 businesses and not more than that. Likewise, Jesus has been a champion for women, developing both the Women in Power program, a single mother's business owner program that provides technical assistance, training, and specific support like access to capital, childcare, and legal services. Mujeres Imparables program, designed to empower women and provide a space in which they can grow personally, professionally, and, great critical, and gain critical entrepreneurship uh, skills. And working in collaboration with Santa Clara University and my own business institution, they created a business academy, which provides direct access to high quality and accessible training courses to small business owners and entrepreneurs wanting to start a business. 
we could be here all night, truly, uh, until 9 o'clock, but I know other people have things to do, so I'll get to it. I want to recognize the kind of support that, uh, that Jesus and the team have done. Uh, they have had over 610 course participants and over 207 graduates. Jesus is a current member of the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force, co-chairing the Supporting Small Business Committee. He's uh, on the Rework the Base Equity at Work Council, the Small Business Advisory Task Force, the San Jose General Plan Four-Year Review Task Force, Latinos in Action 2020 Collective, Silicon Valley Recovery Roundtable, and he's on the Board of Directors for Catholic Charities of Santa Clara County. Lastly, I want to acknowledge that Jesus has developed a large institutional network that allows him to pull worldly knowledge. So above all these professional capacities, recognize, recognitions, and awards, Jesus Flores is a loving father, a devoted husband, and he's an incredible friend. Whether it's La Pulga through COVID-19, our businesses, immigrants or women, San Jose has been strengthened, and I dare say many have been rescued by Jesus Flores for his, uh, because of his hard work and his dedication. Simplemente Jesús, con todo mi corazón, le deseo a usted y a su hermosa familia el mayor éxito. Su compromiso y devoción a nuestra comunidad ha hecho un gran impacto y estoy increíblemente agradecida que con su apoyo hemos podido lidiar con los retos que son que nos ha, nos ha esto que hemos sentido aquí en el distrito y en la ciudad de San José. Hoy cada día les doy las gracias y muchísimas felicidades. And with that, I'm going to ask Vice Mayor to present the commendation, and then you can have a few words. Okay, so I'm gonna try to cool, be brief. I um, I want to thank you. I am honored, and I am very grateful for these words, uh, Councilmember Carrasco. As you mentioned, there's a lot of work. There's a lot that we have done in the past, but I want to recognize that I will not be able to do a lot of what we do without your support and without the support. Vice Mayor Jones and all of the council members. In fact, I want to take this time to, to thank you, council members, each one of you, for all of your support. Um, we know that um, we know that for the past three years, we we've been suffering a lot, and it was because of your actions, council members, because of your actions and your decisions in these chambers that a lot of small businesses were saved. And they're still doing business. And they're still, and now they're thriving. So I want to thank you, council members, for all of your support. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Jones, as well, taking uh, the lead with the uh, San Jose Small Business Advisory Task Force. You, you have done a great, great job in uh, putting together all of these leaders, and I've been learning a lot from you. Thank you, as well. Um, our mayor, Ricardo, is not here today. I wanted to say a few words about him. He's uh, also been a great partner for us. He has been willing to work with our organization, and we have worked in several, several um, uh, programs, including our walks on the, uh, through the uh, business districts, like Alum Rock, Tropicana, and, and, and recently doing and forming our brand new uh, business associations. Um, and lastly, Council Member Carrasco, what can I say? I, I have said it many times, you inspire us, many of us, to do what we do. You do. You do inspire us. I still remember the very first time that I met with uh, Councilmember Carrasco. That was uh, the beginning of 2015. You were very, very new in this position. Um, and we met with Councilmember Carrasco, and I, I said, this is my opportunity. So I took all of my issues, all of our uh, problems that we were having in Allen Brook, and I I threw it all at you, and, 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 and Councilmember Carrasco was there. You gave me time to talk and, um, and express myself. And I remember you mentioned, Jesus, I am listening, and we are taking notes, and let's start working together for the benefit of our community. And 
working together with it, and we've been working together hand in hand for the past eight years. So I really thank you for all your support. Um, just to conclude this, I just want to announce Vice Mayor Jones, Councilmember Carrasco, Council members that uh, in the next few days, on November 17, we're going, we will be announcing our very new, the revival of the Alum Rock Village Business Association. And thank you to your staff, Councilmember Carrasco, thank you to the staff of uh, the mayor, and again, to all of your support. Thank you again. Now the mayor and I uh, would like to recognize and proclaim National Runaway and Homeless Awareness Month. Today we are proclaiming November as National Homeless Youth and Runaway Prevention Month to raise public awareness about the thousands of youth living on the streets and those who are experiencing homelessness through living in their cars, couch surfing, and other forms of temporary housing. These youth struggle to meet basic needs and are at an increased risk for being victims of extremely dangerous situations, including human trafficking. We will be lighting the City Hall Tower in Rotunda Green this Thursday to bring awareness to this cause. And there will also be a green light walk, which the recipient of this proclamation, Sparky Harlan, CEO of the Bill Wilson Center, will tell us more about. Since its founding in 1973, the Bill Wilson Center has been committed to providing young people with programs and services that safeguard and house hundreds of homeless youth each year, including more than 16,000 meals for homeless street youth at the drop-in center near downtown San Jose. Under the leadership of Sparky Harlem, who has been the CEO of the Bill Wilson Center for the past 40 years, more than 100,000 youth have benefited from the agency's programs and services. The Bill Wilson Center has also expanded tenfold in the past four decades. Sparky's amazing work is helping one of our most vulnerable populations earn her, earn her recognition from the White House, and she was awarded champion of change in 2012. Sparky, please uh, say a few words and talk about the tremendous work that you've been totally amazing. I didn't know this was going to be more about me than pro proclaiming Thursday um, Runaway and Homeless Youth Awareness. Um, it's an important day. I remember when I started back in 1983, I think, Many people know that I tend to be more comfortable with the picket sign and doing a march or a protest than just sitting back in an office somewhere. So it stands to reason that this Thursday, we will be meeting outside for a rally and a walk to our drop-in center, uh, proclaiming runaway and homeless youth awareness. And the reason this is so important right now is homeless youth, similar to families, are often invisible. Just look at the last point in time count that was done in this community. The number of homeless youth dropped by 40%. Now, do we really think that homeless youth disappeared by 40%? No, this happened throughout California, especially in communities that locked down during COVID. Most of us believe they went underground um, and we are not able to locate them. Many are couch surfing in dangerous situations. But this January, we'll be recounting and relooking at those numbers. Runaway youth are not going to go away. We're not going to end youth from running away. As long as we have teenagers and parents, kids will leave home. So this is important to prevent youth from running away so they don't become street homeless involved in human trafficking. So come March, I am retiring after 40 years, but we will be continuing this work. And I think back to my neighbor when Tom McHenry started as mayor in the 80s, 
and he was proclaiming in his first homeless task force that he had a plan for ending homelessness, but guess what? He forgot homeless youth. So I had to stand up and remind him, let's not forget young people when we talk about homelessness because they're often overlooked. So I invite you all to join us Thursday at 5.30 here when we take a walk to our drop-in center and really put a shine a green light on the problem of homelessness among our young people. Thank you. Uh, I guess I can put it here, huh? Give me a mic, right? <laughs> Okay, we're on to orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Seeing none, uh, Council Member Cohen will adjourn today's meeting in memory of Robert Bob Stewart, who passed away on September 18th, 2022. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Robert Bob Stewart, a longtime Berryessa business owner and community benefactor, passed away on September 18th at the age of 85. Bob was born in Minnesota in 1937. His family moved to Santa Clara County in the early 1960s, eventually settling in San Jose, where he raised his two children with his wife. He started his real estate career in 1975 and opened his own office in 1978. Uh, Bob owned and operated the Caldwell Banker Real Estate Office on Berryessa Road, which he successfully operated for over four decades. Anybody who knows Berryessa knows that building right in the corner of Berryessa and Morrill, prominent uh, business in Berryessa. As busy as he was, Bob was also generous with his time and energy, often lending out his space to community organizations, including the school district and other business associations and groups uh, to use their facilities. Bob will be remembered as a friend and mentor by those whose lives he touched. He was truly admired and appreciated for his kindness, generosity of spirit, passion for working to make his business and community a better place, and genuine capacity to share his time and talent with others. Bob Stewart is survived by his two children, Todd and Robin, as well as three grandchildren and one great-grandchild, all of whom gave him immense pride and joy. We will miss Bob. Thank you, Council Member Cohen. Uh, on to uh, closed session report, uh, city attorney. Thank you, vice mayor. Uh, we do not have a report out of closed session today. Thank you. Next is the consent calendar. Are there any items that the council wants to pull from the consent calendar? I'll move approval. Second. Thank you. And I don't see any hands raised, so we'll take public comments. Claire Beekman. Hi, everyone. Uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, this is, I think, my second time here since uh, March 2020. Uh, hi to everyone. Um, I, um, I guess the two items I wanted to talk about at Consent Calendar today is uh, 2.9 and 2.10. 2.9 is about uh, the future of warming stations, uh, one in West San Jose, uh, I think the West Valley Library, Public Library, and uh, Roosevelt Center. And uh, this item has been to uh, rules and open government before, and I, I mentioned it would be nice if we could consider in the future a third one, maybe in the East San Jose, but that's always a problem, or can be, you know, in the Tully area. I thought of uh, South San Jose, which also may be a little uncomfortable to people, but I think South San Jose can be a good third option for the future of warming centers, and uh, hope we can, hopefully we can keep that in mind uh, in the future. 
uh, the really good idea of, of warring centers. Um, good luck with that issue. Um, with one one minute remaining to speak on uh, uh, Council President Jimenez's, he's he's uh, asking for a trip to um, uh, South Africa for a conference. Uh, uh, it's an international conference of something, <laughs> and it and it sounds really interesting. And he had taken a previous trip in early October to San Diego and to Tijuana to attend a a, a, a city's conference, and. Um, you know, as as much as we are hoping and pulling that uh, pulling for um, Mayor Licardo to have to offer certain progressive ideas when he's in Egypt currently at this time, it'll be interesting to see what sort of interesting progressive ideas uh, Councilperson uh, Jimenez can bring back from both his Tijuana trip and from South Africa, places that I think uh, can offer really interesting ideas uh, for ourselves how to uh, view issues. And uh, so, good luck in those efforts. From all of us, or for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Caller 1324. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, two things. Number one, these, these minute orders. Okay, we already know what you're doing with these minute orders. If you look at them, you are not talking about what the public is saying. Okay, and here's why. You know that 20, 30 years down the line, that these are going to be the only records that exist of what happened in the city at this particular time. Let me give you an example. When, when you, on, on these minute orders, it says Blair Bigman uh, referred to items on the, on, on the agenda. That's it. That's all it says. It says absolutely nothing, nothing about what he says. Maybe there was an objection to something that the city council was doing. But it doesn't reflect that now, does it? Okay, so there's corruption in these minute orders. I want that changed. I demand that it be changed because the corruption starts there. Number two, the hypocrisy. You guys want to talk about bringing awareness to uh, youth uh, suffering on the street, youth homelessness, but yet you have an opportunity to have that discussion right now with these warming centers and you fail to do it. Why? Because again, none of you want to get on the record talking about that right now at this time of year. How many deaths are we going to have? We had five last year that it was attributed to your failures. How many this year to your failures, huh? How many more deaths are we going to have due to exposure because of your failures? And you sit there and you hypocritically say that you want to draw attention to it. We're going to light up our, our, we're going to light up our candles. But yet you fail to have the discussion right here, right now. I'm done. Caller 6910. Um, I just want to, first, I want to thank Sparky for speaking the truth about unhoused youth um, and the count. Um, I know Sparky's ready to retire, but none of us are ready to have Sparky retire. We're going to need some, uh, you know, counseling over that. Um, I wanted to speak about 2.9. Um, I just, I, it's pure, I feel, I really feel sorry for the housing department because they have to operate under, um, the politics and the politics are that there's a lot of nimbyism saying, no, no, I don't want a warming center in my neighborhood. And so now we have it in the West Valley and the, the majority of unhoused people aren't in the West Valley and aren't going to go to the West Valley. We needed to have warming or overnight warming center, overnight warming location where unhoused people are. They're at Tully, but we have a council member that keep, doesn't like unhoused people and wants to keep not having unhoused people where they are right outside the library, which is ridiculous. Um, we had people, uh, the South Side um, had the South Side Center, and that was an owl once. And then people got upset, and now there's no owl there either. There's no owl on the entire South Side, Districts 2, 9, 10, no owl location there at all. And there are hundreds of unhoused people right there outside all these libraries, and there's no owl for them. There's no owl for oh, so many people, but yet we picked the most remote locations. Like, why didn't we just see if, like, hey, we could push them all into Campbell or into Cupertino? I mean, that's how close we are. It's ridiculous. And I really apologize to the housing department for having to operate with these politics of people pushing them out. And the 
back to the council. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. So another hand just went up. Um, Gail. Thank you. Thank you. I've had my hand up from a long time. I've had my hand up for a while. Thank you, Tony. Hello. Hi. Um, 2.9. Um, we have more unhoused people right now. We had a storm last night. We have a storm today. My RV camp is flooded. The, the, the creeks are high. We need to get more owls. We need not to do the ones on one side of town and then on the other. We need to open maybe Camden. That hasn't been open in a while. Bascom hasn't been open in a while. Pearl Library, I don't think has ever been open. Do you want more death on your hands? I know you hear this year after year after year, but you're not out there. You don't hear the pleas, <clears throat> excuse me, from the unhoused that want to be inside this winter. There's no place to go. If you can, if Home First can't do it, let Life Moves. Home First just got millions of dollars. Let Life Moves open a couple new ones. We need to have this done. We can't not have just the two. It's outrageous. And I think it's been years since Tully has opened up their owl. And we have over 100 people living there. It's time to do something. It's time to do something. And it's up to you all to do it. Please, this is, you know, it, it's outrageous. I mean, I was just so blown away when I heard this. And, and you make, you have to make the decision to open a couple more owls. And Pam needs to have owls in her district. I know she has, but it's time to reopen Camden, please, or Pearl Library. Let's open a couple of more. Give it to Life Moves if Home First can't do their job. Thank you. Molly? Good afternoon. My name is Molly McLeod. Um, I wanted to express my appreciation for um, Sparky Harlan's um, work and the, the center. Um, my son was uh, stayed um, safely there um, for a time when he was homeless. And so um, unhoused youth are definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, and I will um, carry the memory of um, last year's um, unhoused memorial. All those tombstones carefully named um, with flowers representing the race and ethnicity with leaves to represent the elders who passed, the children, including infants um, who died. And um, that's just heartbreaking. Um, I really appreciated uh, Sean's affirmation of the housing, depart housing department's work. I also want to um, note her contributions as a, I want to um, note her contributions as a part of the um, open house steering committee. And um, so as we look at our values and how they are reflected in the budgets, um, let's continue to address racial equity and um, economic equity um, as courageously as was done on those tombstones. Um, and unfortunately, we'll be back for that memorial again. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you. Um, roll call vote, please. Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Roscoe? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is item 3.1, report of the city manager. Um, Jennifer? Yes, thank you, Vice Mayor Jones. Um, I do have a brief report. This past week, the city was honored to receive a visit from United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. 
High Commissioner Filippo Grandi leads the international response to refugee crises around the world, working with governments to ensure that refugees have access to protection and support and helping find solutions to displacement and statelessness. As part of his trip to the Bay Area, he wanted to learn more about the city of San Jose's efforts to create inclusive and supportive environments for refugees and people forcibly displaced. High Commissioner Grandi acknowledged that cities are the first receivers of refugees and migrants and praised San Jose's local collaborative efforts to, to support these vulnerable groups. The Office of Racial Equity plans to build on the momentum generated by the United Nations visit and San Jose's recent certified welcoming designation to further understand and seek new and innovative ways to address the needs of our immigrant and refugee communities. I would like to thank our city manager's Office of Racial Equity team and community partners who helped us host the United Nations High Commissioner of Refugees, as well as Council Member Sergio Jimenez, who participated in the meeting, and Mayor Licardo, Council Member Cohen, and Council Member Mayan, who were able to greet our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Next is item 3.3, financial need-based stipends for boards and commissions. And we have a presentation. Good afternoon, Vice Mayor, City Council, and members of the public. I'm Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager, and I will be presenting a recommendation to the City Council uh, to provide financial need-based stipends for boards and commissions. So just to provide some context, uh, the Charter Review Commission developed a series of recommendations on boards and commissions, one of which was to provide stipends to all members of boards and commissions in the city. And this was uh, considered at a special uh, city council meeting back in April of this year. Um, at that time, the city council directed the city clerk to return to the council through the budget process with the manager's budget addendum with an analysis of the cost and staffing impacts of providing those stipends. Um, the manager's budget addendum number 20 was released um, on May 25th. However, it was not included um, in the final adoption of the budget for fiscal year 2022-2023. Um, then on August 30th of this year, uh, the City Council discussed the new um, Equitable Roundtable, which is now called San Jose for All. And many members of the Council shared an interest in, develop in developing guidelines or standards for stipends for all boards and commissions. And the City Administration uh, indicated that we would return to the City Council with a recommendation. And so we are here this afternoon. And really, our goal is um, centered in equity. Um, very simply, we want to remove barriers for residents and our city to serve and to participate on boards and commissions. We want to include a diversity of voices and identities with the outcome that there are more perspectives in shaping the city's policies, programs, and budgets. Uh, and we also expect that providing stipends will help with filling many of the vacancies that we currently have on our commissions. So in our analysis, we took a look at many of the existing models we already have uh, in the city. Um, back in April of this year, the City Council approved a new seat for a person with lived experience with homelessness on the Housing and Community Development Commission. Uh, that person will receive a $200 uh, stipend per month, dependent on attending a monthly meeting. Um, in August, the council also approved the new commission for the Community Stabilization and Opportunity Pathways Fund. Uh, this is a 13-seat commission. Five seats of that commission are for people with lived experience. Those five members will also receive a $200 uh, stipend per month, dependent on attendance at a meeting. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in August, the council accepted the status report for San Jose for All. 
Um, and the members of this new advisory body will receive a $100 stipend every two months, regardless of meeting attendance. So our staff recommendation, oh, let me go back one, sorry. Just need to go back one slide. There we go, thank you. So staff recommendation is to provide a financial need-based stipend of $200 per month to members of boards and commissions. Um, this would be provided to those members who do not currently uh, receive a stipend. Um, there would be a requirement to attend a monthly meeting. Uh, these members would receive the stipend even if the meeting is canceled. Uh, and then finally, the financial financial needs will be based on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development definition for low-income households in Santa Clara County. Uh, currently, the area median income for a family four in the county is $168,500, and you can see the breakdown uh, for households here in the county. So these individuals would be eligible to apply for the stipend. As part of the recommendation and next steps, the clerk's office will develop the stipend application form and post it to the website. And the city manager's office will be following up with city departments to ensure that the stipends are budgeted in individual departments budget and to ensure um, coordination. And then lastly, I just want to acknowledge the memorandum from Council Member Jimenez today regarding compensation or stipends to residents who participate in community engagement activities and processes. This is actually something that the administration is looking into. Um, we know that compensation and incentives for our residents can come in many different forms, and so we've been looking at uh, providing residents gift cards to complete a survey, for example, or providing stipends to those people with lived experiences to design and host a focus group um, or a pop-up activity, uh, and also looking into compensating residents for participating in community leadership training programs. So those are just some examples um, that we are going to be looking into. Uh, and working with our city departments, uh, the city manager's office will continue this exploration and research and return to council with a recommendation in spring of next year. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we will now go to public comments. Blair? Hi, uh, Blair Beekman. I just wanted to try to offer a quick few things, hopefully. Uh, one, uh, thank you, interestingly, that you've changed the name of the Equity Roundtable to San Jose for All. I think it's a good name. <laughs> yeah, I think it, uh, it accomplishes a lot. And uh, I guess there were questions about using the word roundtable as an English derivative uh, from, you know, England and, uh, you know, the Middle, a middle Ages era of, of thinking. and. Uh, I think we're trying to find different ways to address that, and you have. San Jose for All is a, a very good name. Thank you. Uh, I also wanted to note that uh, uh, just a, a thank you for this item and, and how you're trying to work on it and to uh, offer a reminder that um, you're also, with these issues, working on the, the process of the future of the commission and board's process to be, to be able to house uh, or to be able to have unhoused people and uh, persons with disability uh, on, on their board, on the boards. And um, that's work that's taken a long time to work on as well. And uh, I think it is moving forward and I think San Jose for All is gonna help with that also. Uh, good luck how that, that process can be developing uh, for the future of commissions and boards as well. Thank you. Caller 1324. Caller 1324. Okay, I'm going to move on to Alex Shore. Hey,
to express support for this recommendation. You know, as you know, Catalyze This Week cares a lot about community engagement and the idea that we are further enabling more people, especially a greater diversity of people, to participate in city processes is a fantastic thing. Um, in my role on a city commission, I, I see the need for more diverse voices, particularly those who have lived experiences, uh, have knowledge of equity issues. Uh, those just bring a lot of value to us on the commission. And I think compensating folks for their time who might not have as much, who might be struggling to make ends meet is just an outstanding idea to be less extractive of our community and helping lift up those and bring them into the city government, its processes and its policies is just so fantastic. So thank you to Rosalind and all the city staff who've been working with so many commissions to vet these ideas and discuss them. Uh, at least for me, as someone who's middle class, I don't feel like I need or deserve a compensation to sit on a commission. I feel like it's my pleasure and a civic duty. So I'm really glad that we're focusing the funding on those who are in greatest need. Uh, that's truly how we lift up everyone in our city and continue the city's in increasing focus on equity. Thanks so much for the time to talk about this issue. Molly? Hello, Molly McLeod. Um, wholeheartedly supporting the needs-based stipends and also wanting to um, ask that consideration be given to how that stipend is um, distributed. So for example, um, folks who are with disabilities um, who are on a limited extremely limited income, um, far below what the, the amounts that were listed there are getting, um, for example, uh, SSI or um, SSDI. Um, what are the opportunities to be able to put that into a Cal ABLE account? Um, don't want anybody to be bumped off of uh, their uh, benefits when uh, volunteering, um, essentially, and, and committing to the public good. And so the framing of, of how that's being done, um, I certainly hope that uh, disabled expertise will be included in the process um, and to have it as streamlined as possible. Thank you for your consideration and for this move towards um, racial and economic equity. Back to the council. Thank you, council member Jimenez. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a few uh, <clears throat> comments. Obviously, we submitted a memo. Uh, part of the, the reason for the memo was just to highlight that there's other non-board, non-commissions uh, groups doing work like the what's mentioned in the memo, the quarterly open house community gathering fair housing. There's folks with lived experience on there that uh, weren't necessarily following in the in this in this bucket, if you will. So uh, we don't. It seems to me, based on what you described, is that. Uh, we don't necessarily, do, I, do we need to approve this or you're already, the staff's already gonna go look at it, right? There's no need to approve a separate memo. All right, thank you so much, Council Member Jimenez. Yes, yeah, staff is currently working on okay. this issue. We've been um, gathering information from different city departments that have actually considered compensations, stipends, gift cards, and some community uh, engagement processes where our consultants actually have received grant to be able to give those stipends and incentives to our residents. So we're gonna to continue to do that work and then bring a recommendation back to council in the spring. The idea is to, to provide some, some guidelines or a standard by which all of these ad hoc um, engagement processes can build from. Mm -hmm. Okay, that I know sometimes the ad hoc take just as much time as other committees and such. So I, I appreciate that. So uh, I'll just move staff's recommendation to approve this and look forward to hearing back sometime in the spring. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Council Member Foley. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and, and for the motion. I, I'm going to support it, but I just had a clarifying question regarding the the uh, household income and the numbers that we're considering would qualify for this and specifically for a one person household, 
we they would be eligible for funding if they received up to ninety two thousand two hundred and fifty. I'm struggling with that number. Is there I'm struggling because it's high. I feel it's it's high for someone. I understand the reason and I support the reason of giving financial assistance to those who have a financial need to encourage them to attend and participate in our boards and commissions. I think it's uh, really laudable what we're trying to do and it's a, a, a great opportunity. But for someone who makes $92,000 in a single person household, so that's one person, that's, that's more than uh, many of our staffs here at council. So if they are on a commission, they would be eligible for this. Was any consideration given for reducing the high number? Thank you so much, Councilmember Foley. Um, yeah, so what we did in terms of coming up with this recommendation, we actually have an existing model um, on an existing commission. So the Housing and Community Development Commission, they have a seat um, set aside for residents that are low income. And so in talking with both actually the city clerk's office and the housing department, uh, we understood that basically they're using the HUD guidelines um, and the definition for low income. Um, obviously there are other definitions we could use. We could use extremely low income or very low income, but because we have this existing model, we thought it made sense to be consistent. Um, and, and use this same um, low income threshold that we use for the Housing and Community Development Commission. But certainly understand your concern. Um, you know, here in Santa, Santa Clara County in the city, incomes are high, and so our area median income is, is you know, it's, it's pretty high compared with other cities. I, I appreciate that, and, and I, I'm, I'm just looking at, actually the one person income of 92,000. If you go down to four person income, that's a, a two breadwinners likely and two kids. So there's definite, I can see the need and I can make an argument for need. I can't make an argument in my mind for someone who is a single person earning $92,000 because I know what some of our kids out of college are making and it isn't 92,000 unless you're in the tech world and then maybe you are. But even then, if you're earning 92, you still qualify for $100. So I'm looking at who's on the planning commission, would they be eligible? Do they are they gainfully employed? So we do we I'm I'm just struggling with that. I'm going to support the motion, but I hope when these applications come that we give a stronger weight to accepting them and compensating those who have a stronger financial need than someone who is at the high end of the pay scale with this. I understand why we're using this grid. I'm struggling with the one person, 92,000 income. That's a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you. Rosalind, I just have a couple quick questions. One is on the um, compensation for the missed meetings. Now I know for a lot of meetings, we publish the calendar at the beginning of the year and sometimes things change, would they be compensated regardless of when the meeting notification came out? Because I know some meetings are canceled at the last minute where they would been, have been engaged in you know, the research and reading and all the other things, but if we publish a, a calendar in January and we make a change in February for a November meeting, would they still be compensated for that? Thank you, Vice Mayor. So the short answer is yes. Uh, and, and again, staff in consulting with city department staff who uh, support other commissions, for example, like the planning commission that receives a stipend, they get that stipend even if a meeting is, is canceled or not. Totally understand your concern. I think for simplicity um, and for ease of administration, it would just be easier if we have the same um, rule across the board. And so that's why we decided to go with the existing model of, of other uh, commissions that currently do still provide the stipend, even if the me meeting is canceled. Sometimes meetings are canceled at the last minute. And to your point, sometimes, you know, meeting dates are already established and they are canceled in advance. 
All right. Um, I'm going to perfectly understandable. Just, I have a little bit of hesitation around that, but I'm not going to belabor the point. The other question I had was about, uh, especially some of the income brackets that we have identified, um, if they're going to get a stipend, and I found this out the hard way from experience that the taxes aren't withheld from that stipend, and they'll get a potentially a, a nice uh, tax bill at the end of the uh, at the end of the year. Is, is there going to be some kind of orientation or you know work with the uh, our, uh, members to help them understand that you know they are they're going to be responsible for paying the taxes on the on that stipend. Yes, thank you, council members. Certainly the, the clerk's office, um, as they go through their onboarding, or onboarding process with all new commissioners, will make sure that for those commissioners who decide to apply for the stipend, um, that they understand uh, the requirements. Um, obviously, the city is required to report the payments um, to non-employees to the Internal Revenue Service, so they will be um, having to complete W-9 form, so we will make sure that um, everyone who applies for the stipend is, is fully aware of the requirements. Great, I appreciate it. Thank you, so uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised, so Tony? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Rothko? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Next is item 3.4, Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act hearing for California Municipal Finance Authority's issuance of tax exempt multifamily revenue bonds to finance the 2050 South Bascom affordable housing development. Actually, let me read that one more time. <laughs> okay, and there's no presentation, so we'll go for public comments. I have no hands up. All right. Uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you. So a couple of months ago, we had a discussion about a development in District 9 on in Cambriana, and the discussion was about it not being uh, high density, not high enough in density in that neighborhood. And at the time, I made a statement that there were several projects coming forward that were affordable housing projects. And this item and the next item that we vote on are evidence that District 9 has affordable housing coming in uh, to our area. And, the, and if we approve this motion today, that's the funding that will help these developers build those two projects. And I will note that between this one and 3.5, that's a total of 394 affordable housing units coming in to District 9 probably within a year or so. So uh, one question I had, we do a lot of outreach on these affordable housing projects. They do use state legislation in every case to get their project through. But does the California Municipal Finance Authority conduct any public outreach or community engagement or is the city the one who's the main entity who's answering my question i don't know who's <laughs> who uh, is or is it the city who's responsible for any sort of out outreach oh there she is okay hi rachel i didn't see you up there sorry Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, and uh, Rachel Vanderveen, Deputy Director with the Housing Department. So the answer to the question is that the city would, um, or the developer and the city will be managing the public outreach, and the bond issuer in this case, um, they will be processing the issuance of the bonds, but will not have a touch with the community. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. So if there's any outreach, and it's usually not about the financing anyway, it's about the project itself, it's the developer leads it and the council, our council office is very active as well. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, with that, I will move approval. All right, it's been moved. 
been moved and seconded twice. So um, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Prosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Aye. Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. All right. Let me take another crack at this item 3.5. Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act hearing for California Municipal Finance Authority's issuance of tax exempt multifamily revenue bonds to finance the view at Blossom Hill affordable housing development. Whew. All right, um, we'll go to public comments. I have no hands up. All right, Council Member Foley. I'll just echo my comments from the last one and move approval. All right, it's been moved and seconded. I don't see other hands raised. Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Prosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Next is item 3.6, actions related to the um, 10, uh, 201 uh, SJC Airport Accessibility Upgrades Phase 3A Terminal Buildings Rebidding Project. And we have a presentation? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, Catherine Brown, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, I just need to make an addition to the recommendation language under item A. Okay. Uh, it should read the following, or addition to the following. Uh, decide any timely bid protests and make the city's final determination as to the lowest responsive bidder that is responsible as needed to award the contract. Great, thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, we'll go to public comments. I have no public comments. Okay, we'll bring it back to the council. Move approval. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Item 3.7, acceptance of retirement plans, comprehensive annual investment fee reports for calendar year 2021. And we do have a presentation. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Prabhu Palani, Chief Investment Officer for the retirement system and I'm here with trustee Sunita Ganapati of the police and fire board and this is the fifth year that we are presenting this uh, fee report uh, the first three years I presented with trustee Vincent Zeri who retired uh, last year um, and now trustee Sunita Ganapati is uh, uh, is my partner in presenting this um, I had actually prepared 15 minutes but I was told to keep it to five so I'm going to actually stick to the numbers, uh, but I will be happy to take any and all questions. Uh, with that, let me actually move on. And so when we present fees, it's just not fees that we pay to our managers, it's actually total expense. And so that includes operating expense as well, uh, fees that we pay to consultants, staff salaries and benefits. Uh, third-party vendors and so on so it's a comprehensive fee report and I should add that there are very very few public plans out there that present such a comprehensive fee report we have one of four or five plans out there that are this transparent with fees and expenses so this is for calendar year 2021 uh, so we do uh, calculate fees on a calendar year basis as you can see from here um, on, on this chart, all the way to the right is expense ratio. And for all four plans put together, that's the federated plan, the police and fire pension plan, the health, both the healthcare trusts, uh, the fees are 155 basis points or 1.55%.
And just to give you some comparison of with prior years, you can see that, so the fees have been coming down uh, from 129 basis points, 1.29%, all the way to 1.11% last year. And this year it's gone up to 1.55%. And I'm gonna explain why it's gone up this year. And so there's three components to fees. There's management fees, and there's incentive fees, which we pay based on performance. And last year, our managers, especially on the private side, did extremely well. And that's why those fees have gone up. And I will actually uh, explain that in greater detail. But to the right uh, is peer comparison, and that's from the ACFR chart. And that shows where ORS is compared to our peers. And that's the green bubble that you can see there. And we are somewhere to the middle of the pack to slightly below average compared to our peers. And our peers there are, you know, CalPERS, CalSTRS, Contra Costa, Orange County, Alameda County, and so on. So this is the breakdown of the fees last year. So what we can control is management fees. And that has been pretty steady over the last three years. Uh, it was 54, 53 basis points. Uh, but incentive fees have gone up. It's 102 basis points. And that's the fee that we pay uh, when managers do better than their benchmarks. And so you can see from here, the active versus pa passive average allocations in 2021. So where possible, we actually employ passive managers. And that is, for example, if we are managing large cap US equity, uh, there's very little excess return to be had. And so we will actually invest in the index. And so you can see from this that roughly almost half the plan is passive management. And with passive management, we do have the advantage of lower fees. And about half of it is active management. So I, I said before that the only thing that we can control is management fees, not performance fees. And of the management fees, uh, it's totally 54 basis points, 52 basis points to active managers, two basis points to passive managers. And to the right, you can see, so tw of the 54, 20 basis points is to actually active managers, long only active managers, seven basis points is to hedge funds, and 25 basis points of management fee is to private funds. And you can see that the management fee ratio trend has come down, and this is something that we worked hard to reduce. And uh, in 2017, it was 77 basis points uh, for federated, 84 basis points for police and fire, and the combined was 78 basis points. And as you can see, it's been trending down and we've probably reached somewhat of a plateau at about 53 basis points. And fees are driven not so much just by the choice of active versus passive. It also depends on asset allocation. So if we have private assets, for example, then they do command higher fees and we pay those fees. This shows our asset allocation targets. I just said that fees are driven by asset allocation. You can see that about half uh, for the federated pension plan is in public equity, 49%, and that's 42% for police and fire pension plan. But you can also see that fully a quarter of the plan uh, for police and fire pension, 25% is in private markets, and the federated pension plan is 21% in private markets. So those are asset classes that do command higher fees. Uh, this is, again, just showing, uh, you know, the breakdown between passive, hedge, active, and private assets. Um, that concludes my formal presentation. I try to keep it very brief. I'm happy to take questions. I might just add one thing that um, yes. uh, the uh, point that uh, Prabhu made on uh, private asset private uh, asset classes that are commanding more fees, but they also proportionally are expected to ha generate higher returns than uh, public markets, so compensates for those fees. Thank you, uh, thank you for the presentation. We'll now go to public comments. Caller 1324. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I think that we have some ethical questions to ask where these pension funds are being uh, invested. Um, are they being invested in private prison industry? Are they invested in uh, technologies in technologies that uh, have something to do with surveillance of immigrant communities? 
Are they invested with Google that does that kind of um, technological work? I think we need to, when we talk about racial equity, when we talk about justice, what we are doing is we are reversing a lot of the historical, um, I won't even say injustices, just the historical brutality that has been um, weighed upon and forced upon the public and people that do not have the capacity to defend themselves. I would challenge anybody that the greatest crimes that are committed against human beings are not on the streets of San Jose, but in the halls of City Hall. See, it's in the documents where the crimes are committed. When we see things happen on the street or we see deficits within our budgets that take money away from uh, social or, 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 or economic programs that would uplift people, we can look to these types of retirement plans and see just that, that this is where the lion's share of the budgets are being taken. Another question that I have is how many of the uh, how many of how much of the budget is paid directly to the pension fund? How much of what is the percentage that goes directly to the pension fund, and what percentage goes to active officers and administrators? Those are questions that I think that are legitimate and, and deserving of asking because it's my money. It's not the city council's money. It's my money. I'm the public. I want to know where this money is being invested in: private prisons, surveillance of citizens. Those are legit questions I want answered. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you. Um, and I want to thank um, the team for all the hard work in terms of getting uh, those fees down. I know that we've been riding you pretty hard over the last three years about those fees. So that was a po it's going in a positive direction. Uh, one quick question, though, is for the active management is based on performance, but is is the fee entirely based on how um, it performs over uh, the market? You know, if, if, if it's a passive, you know, a passive investment. So, is it the, the delta between what I would get just investing in an index fund versus what they, the returns that they generate? Yeah, that's right. So, when it comes to performance fees, usually there's a hurdle rate. And it could be the benchmark, or it could be actually even uh, uh, an absolute number. And when they beat that number, the fees, the performance fee is based on the delta between the actual performance and the hurdle rate. Thank you. Um, Council Member Mayer. Thanks, Vice Mayor. That was similar to the question I had, which is just more, setting aside the incentive fees when you just look at the management fees. Have we consistently found that actively managed? more than pay for themselves? Has that been a consistent trend? Yeah, no, that's a great question and it's something that we monitor. And in fact, the three years ended um, June 30th of 2022. Uh, between the two plans, our active managers added a combined $90 million over and above the fees. Got over and above the fees. And how about compared with passive? Probably the more relevant question. Yes, so after fees compared to passive. Compared to passive. Yes. Yeah, exactly. okay. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. All right, then. They've earned it. They did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With that, I'll move acceptance of the report. All right. All right. We have a motion and a second. And I don't see any hands raised over Zoom. So, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Prosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8.1, approve the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority license agreement for the safe parking program. I don't see a presentation. We're going to go to the public for public comments. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, Thanks a lot for the words of Paul Soto on the previous item. We've done some really important work with, um, in 2017, I think, with uh, sanctuary city policies and, and what to expect of them and how to work with other cities and how to invest. Uh, maybe that can be of help. For this item, I wanted to offer that uh, uh, thank you that your city has, has, br has brought this uh, to, to a council agenda to talk about uh, VTA's program. And I suppose what 
what uh, San Jose's part can be in it. Um, you had a really interesting, uh, it was a rules meeting or a city council meeting a couple of weeks ago where, you know, a lot of people came in here to describe and ask what can we do about the future of uh, safe parking and, and RV programs or RV programs. Uh, you know, what are we going to do with uh, RV issues, basically? And safe parking programs seems like a really good answer to, to that. And um, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say about this today and how it can be applied to the future of RV programs. And it was uh, said at that meeting, you know, the good stuff that's being worked on in Mountain View with RV issues that, uh, boy, it just, I, every time I get a chance to, to remind ourselves of that, it's nice to do. So uh, good luck on this sort of issue and uh, how it can develop for our future. Thank you. Paul? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I would have liked the presentation. The presentation, you know, would have been nice. I think this topic, um, the fact that no council member or nobody from the city wants to get on record making any kind of statements about this is very, very, it's telling. It's conspicuous. Um, I'm sick and tired of the Band-Aids. It's obvious you guys aren't. You guys can do Band-Aids until you've gentrified all of the people that you have like like in your in your sites in your bullseye sites until you've gentrified all those people out of here i'm sure that this city is very very comfortable with these band-aid solutions and never really addressing the problem okay how many more deaths are we going to have due to exposure my estimation last year we had five i think we can have 10 to 15 this year and it's all going to be due to your failures your failure as a city and your failure as a human being because it takes a human being to have compassion and compassion is twofold. Number one is that you feel sympathy or empathy. Number two is that that sympathy or empathy compels an action to do something to alleviate that suffering. And so just because you sit there and you sympathize or empathize with the situation means nothing. We need your action. And this is a band-aid because it doesn't address the core problem and the core issue. And that is that you are creating poverty in this city that is gentrifying a particular class of people into suffering first, poverty first, then the suffering, then either death or they have to leave. I'm done. Caller 6910. Um. <clears throat> I actually kind of want to follow all of that. It, to me, it's a lack of political will, and I'll just keep saying it away at that. Um, we can't be excited that, oh, there's finally going to be another VPA safe parking site. We've known that more and more people are taking refuge in RVs because there's a caste system. The people in the tents are the lowest. The people in the RVs are better. And the people who are couch surfing are better than that. Everyone's a little bit safer. And so the people in the RVs want to do everything they can to hang on to those to not be subject to the horrible weather like right now. You are out at Columbus Park. That is a giant mud pit. And outside the mud pit are swimming pools. And nobody should be having to go through that. But they are right now. There should be safer areas for people in RVs where they can stay, where they can hook up, where there's porta potties, where it's not in the middle of a giant mud pit with swimming pools surrounding it. Um, and we've known about this for years. And there's going to be more and more people at RVs because the seniors, the silver tsunami that we've also known about that we should have planned better for, those people take the RVs first before landing on the street. It's their last refuge. And right now, about two hundred people have died on the street and that is your shame a lot of it is political will not in my district bowing to political pressure bowing to funders saying that well we can't have this you know it's election year i don't want to have to have to deal with this and that's what's happened and every death should hang over you like it hangs over us because the majority of those people who die are people that we know personally and maybe you should get to know them Charles?
Charles Howard. All right, I found the unmute button. Uh, I look at this uh, homeless situation as for big cities, homelessness has been here since Julius Caesar ran Rome. And that means that homelessness is here to stay. And it is definitely a problem now in my view. And ending homeless as a problem really means to govern it well, you know, to take care of it the best you can do with the resources available. And well really means a responsible and compassionate due process for the governed by the government. Now the governed includes the homeless you and me, and you are the government. So you are responsible for the due process, what the government does and the direction it is heading. And the San Jose uh, growth housing plan seems to me a strong move in that direction. And the memo uh, in front of the council at the moment seems like a good direction to go and I hope you support it. So it's a question of what are you getting for your money? And people like RVs, and therefore you can, if you think about that, you can say they might very well like modular homes, which we could uh, construct kind of like uh, Lego blocks and uh, have as many or as few as we need. But think about the future, please, and uh, pass this motion. Thank you. Jill? Hi, this is Jill Borders. I'm in District 10 and I'm calling in today because I'm hopeful that you will pass this memo today that's up from Council Member Mahan and uh, Mayor Licardo. I'm a bit confused by Council Member Cohen's memo to defer it until November 28th and hopefully there'll be some clarity there. Um, I'd like to see it pass today because I want you to know that it's given me just even a sliver of hope if we could get this one going in District 10 and get it going quickly. Um, when you know people's names, when you have met somebody who you know is living in their van, and you know that you've talked to them and given them this idea, call this number, you know, do this, do that, and you're doing everything you can to give them hope, and you keep hearing the words deferred, deferred, well, that's fine. If you guys have to policy make forever to get to the perfect, that's what you're doing, but we're out here and we're meeting people. So I'm looking to tell Stephanie that today she's one step closer because she parks here in District 10 and is, is my friend that I'd like to go say, Stephanie, we're closer. We're just getting that much closer. And so her year long wait to get Section 8 housing and her efforts to keep her small dog vaccinated and her efforts to make sure that she has her car registration paid, her efforts to do everything are also hinging on your effort today to pass this and to stop deferring it. I am so grateful that in District 10, I know exactly where this is because I've lived here in District 10 my whole life. Um, my dad lives right there, I grew up right there. Um, I love how many, how much effort has been put into making this a wonderful place. So please pass this. Let's let's make this happen for people. Isaac. Isaac Kao. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi all. My name is Isaac and I am the president of uh, Palmia Association. I also speak on behalf of many residents of neighboring association. The Santa Teresa safe, uh, safe parking site is surrounded by many communities. Um, and I would like to mention just a few of them. We have the Green Association, Avenue One, Urban Oaks, California Grove, Station 121, and Rancho Santa Teresa, and many more. Just FYI, for instance, the Safeway parking site the Santa Teresa one is basically uh, affects both District 2 and District 10. So 
our communities reached out to Councilman Matt Mehan and met with him multiple times to discuss uh, our concerns regarding the Santa Teresa VTA's uh, safe uh, parking site. Then we came up with a two mile radius solution. So here we have a solution that would be agreeable between neighbors, the city and the residents of the site. So today, maybe an election day and council may be wanting to fight for their preferred candidate who will move forward with the status quo. But what we as communities want is forward thinking and scalable solution. We are in support of Matt Mehan memorandum and we encourage the council to put aside politics and to move forward with solutions. Again, we respectfully urge the council to move forward with the memo signed by Councilman Mehan and Mayor Ricardo. So please put politics aside and just do the right thing. Thank you all. Yeah. Hi, am I, am I talking? I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, thanks for this item. Um, I'd like to defer it. Um, we had a real good rules meeting last week, and there was a lot of items regarding the RVs and a lot of discussion. I, I truly believe that we need to put all those in one area, one box, and talk about it at once. And that will be happening on the 29th. And I think that you should also be listening to the RV people that um, live in RV that might want to live there. And um, this area, I know people aren't going to like this, but we could sure have a lot more RVs there, more than 40. We need to get the RVs off the street. And there's such strict guidelines. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of folks don't have registration. Um, but we, we we need to defer this. That's all I'm going to say because there's a lot to talk about RVs. I live in D2. I um, I love that area. I'm in all the meetings that we've been having, and I thank both council people for the meetings. But um, let's not vote on anything today. Let's get everything in one bucket. There's a lot more about RVs that can be discussed. And I think the two mile radius, I think Life Moves can take care of that. I don't think there should be a radius. Uh, Life Moves has done a great job with all their other RV sites. And the one in Mountain View is what has been run perfectly. Uh, what scares me the most, if somebody comes in and less than the two miles and, you know, if there's security, they might arrest people. We don't need that. So please let's defer this till the 29th of uh, November. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you, Council Member Mahan. Thanks, Vice Mayor. Appreciate it. Uh, I'll just say a few things and then talk about the memos. I want to first start by thanking Council Member Jimenez for pushing forward this solution. I, I think he recognized the challenges we all face in our districts with on-street, unmanaged, lived-in vehicles, and uh, worked with city staff, housing department, and others to identify a solution, which I think is really important. We're going to need a lot more solutions like this is one, one kind of step from unmanaged street homelessness toward that kind of ladder up to hopefully permanent housing. Um, I, we, we had the handoff through redistricting. This site was in District 2, moved into District 10. I think as he and I both heard loudly and clearly from the neighborhood, as we all do with these kinds of sites, a lot of concern about how the site would be managed, impacts on the broader neighborhood. One of the things um, my team honed in on through many conversations with the neighbors was what kinds of assurances we might be able to make to make it a win-win for the neighborhood. My, my general belief is when a neighborhood is asked to be part of the solution, whether it's anything from permanent supportive housing to a more transitional site to maybe a treatment center, whatever it might be, we, we really ought to articulate the specific things we're gonna do to make sure that surround the immediate neighborhood is better, not worse off. And um, so what I've put in my memo along with the co-signed by the mayor is a, an outline of what that could look like. I, I also read Councilmember Cohen's memo, and I think we're actually not 
far apart. I, my intention was actually to defer that deliberation to the 29th. That's why I wrote the memo. But the goal was to outline what the principles of that kind of program might look like, because I don't want to end up on the 29th being told, well, now we need to go do a bunch of additional work to have a conversation about some kind of preference or buffer zone. And so I wanted to outline here and codify the conversations we've been having already with city staff about what this could look like. And I understand there's not necessarily agreement that we absolutely will do this. I don't think there's consensus on the council and I don't know that staff yet has, has given us their recommendations. But I do wanna ensure, I would like to ensure with the council's support that on the 29th, we talk about the concept of prioritizing within a certain radius, the RVs that are in the immediate vicinity keeping that, showing our work, if you will, keeping that area then clear of RVs once we've done that outreach and consideration of a narrower radius for uh, not allowing um, tent encampments. And so I, I wanna just I, lay out that to me, that ought to be part of the conversation on the 29th. And I believe staff is already doing that research and planning to make that part of the conversation, but it hasn't actually been codified. So whether or not we, Pass the memo matters less to me. I just want to make clear that that's a conversation we've already been having, and I'd like to have some structure around it when we come back on the 29th and talk more holistically. This happens to be the only RV safe park site, so it's a little unique, but I think these principles, as I had articulated with a previous memo back in June related to the Great Oaks site, I think these principles could apply to any quick build, bridge housing, safe park, I, I don't think it necessarily matters exactly what the site is. I think it's more about how do we build trust with neighborhoods and show our work so that there's an incentive. So a neighborhood that comes by and says, wow, this neighborhood's really, really clean. There's no encampments, there's no RVs. Yeah, because they took on part of the solution and there it is. And then we did our part to take care of the surrounding neighborhood. So that's kind of the principle of it. Um, I, I'll actually wait to move my memo to hear more discussion because I think actually reading Councilmember Cohen's my memo as well was meant to push the substantive deliberation and any decision making to the 29th. This was an outline of what I want to make sure staff brings back for potential uh, adoption on the 29th as a as a potential pilot. So what I will hold off on moving any memos to hear from my colleagues. Thank you, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, thank you, um, and I, I appreciate some of your clarification, Councilmember Mahan. Um, you know, we, we've had a lot of long discussions at rules in the last couple months about RV parking and solutions to RV and, and the memo, you, you and others are part of the me a memo that got that going. And this is one of the big priorities for many of us. Um, I, I showed a video of a particularly impacted site in District 4 that has over nearly 50 RVs on one street in, in the north part of District 4. Um, we're, we're probably, we have some huge issues in that district and I'm, I'm Omar can attest to the fact that pretty much every other day I say when are we going to get a site in district four and I'm committed to that in fact I want multiple sites in district four just like I hope we'll get sites across the city um, my problem is that it seems like we had a the outlines of a of what is a a lot of work for staff to try to um, just a, a accomplish what's in the discussions that we had and I'm not convinced that we can enforce the kinds of things that are in the memo. And I understand we're, we want to hear from staff about what they think is enforceable and not enforceable and what's doable and not, not doable. My issue is that until we have enough sites to handle the folks who are in RVs in the community, it's really hard for us to continue. And we've experienced this with abatements in various ways in our district. We end up with, with, with chasing people around and not really solving the problem. And I'm concerned about a policy that says we're going to take this first site and, and somehow keep it clear, the area around it, especially a two mile radius, which is a, a huge radius, um, and keep that clear while we don't have solutions elsewhere and we push the problem into the other places around the city which have large concentrations of RVs. Also, it's the, the original memo that, that was voted on at rules has um, prioritized finding places for people who are at Guadalupe Gardens. And so I wasn't clear, and maybe I can ask somebody here to, to expand on this. This is, this is the first RV site. Um, 
my intention, obviously, in this memo is for us to move ahead with this RV site because it's an important tool. Were we, were we planning on using this first site as to help folks that are currently at Guadalupe Gardens? Um, good afternoon. I'm Jackie morales friend. I'm the director. <laughs> and you're absolutely right. So we are planning on using this site uh, to relocate uh, the RVs that are still waiting to, for a place to go after the closing down of the airport site. Uh, and I just wanted to also make note, it is also accurate to say that it has been the Housing Department's policy to anytime we open up a homeless facility, to invite the people who are living around those facilities into these sites as well. So that's also a cons that, that's also something we already do and uh, support. Um, but in the, in this case, we have made that a priority when we came to you to talk about the number of RVs and the, just the amount of people that were living. At the, um, at the Guadalupe site that we needed to use all of our resources to ensure that we could house as many people as possible. Right, so, so um, yeah, so I just wanna make sure it's clear. I mean, it's, it's, it would be hard to say we're gonna prioritize district, it, it, what, two mile radius around Correct. this site while we're also trying to deal with the big problem at Guadalupe. My concern is we fill a lot of the space at this new site with maybe Guadalupe and a few that are in the immediate vicinity, and then we say we're gonna purge the area two mile radius, that's gonna drive them maybe back to Guadalupe or to other places in the city. So it's not clear we would have a, a solution if we did that. So I- Yeah, so correct. So I think you know the, the bigger policy question that you'll be looking at when we come back, um, and again, thinking through as we open up sites is, you know, what is the bigger picture regarding abatements and where those are happening and when we're trying to remove vehicles and trying to ensure if we have a big project like this, you know, obviously it was really important to have this site be available as a future landing site. And so, uh, no doubt, uh, this becomes more complex because we, as you just said, do not have enough sites for everyone and all the work you want us to do. I'm hopeful that um, at some point we'll have enough sites where we can start to say, hey, we got people, there's places for people and they, they must go and take those places. But until we have that service available for folks who are living uh, in their RVs, it, it becomes a really untenable situation to begin to create areas where RVs can't be parked. And I'm, I don't know, that, that's not necessarily the question. I'm just giving, stating my, my viewpoint at this point. Um, I, I'm, also, I'm also just slightly concerned about some of the language which, which kind of reinforces the notion that we hear from residents across our city that building a, a site becomes a magnet for problems in an area. Um, you know, obviously we've had some issues with some of the sites that have come up and we're working on trying to resolve those issues and find appropriate sites. But I, I'm trying to make clear to our residents that, that these sites are a solution that will benefit everyone and that, that these sites are not something that become blight or a or a detriment to a neighborhood. So I, I wanna, I just wanna be careful about buying into the frame that solutions such as interim housing or RV sites are now something that are bringing blight to a community and we have to address. Um, anyway, I th you know, there's a lot that's going, gone into the discussion at rules and I know for those people who are not on rules, um, you, you'll, we'll see it in the, on the 29th, but there were, there's a whole lot of other items uh, as part of this that have to do with providing resources to people who need their RVs fixed, helping people with uh, re their, some financial assistance, um, making sure that they have all the services they need for RVs. Also, safety issues in areas where RVs remain on the street. For example, uh, where we have high density of RVs that are causing problems with visibility for drivers or, or crosswalk problems, we should be enforcing that. So there are a lot of things that are in this memo coming back on the 29th, and I was worried about saddling staff with additional uh, work on trying to figure out how to create uh, zone areas that are not, that are, that are uh, homeless free at the same time as we're really bringing back a lot of work to try to accommodate um, interim housing and RV parking for um, homeless, unhoused residents. 
so I'll, I'll go ahead and move my memo um, and uh, and look forward to the full discussion on RV sites on the 29th. It's a, it's a big priority of mine, and I think a lot of us on this council, to begin to get RVs into places that are safe for them and for the community, and we'll get people um, the services that they need as they're unable to afford uh, other types of living conditions. Second. Thank you, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Council Member Jimenez. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate uh, much of what was said, uh, Council Member Cohen, to, to your comments. I appreciate the acknowledgement of some of the language. I, I, I don't want to continue to play into people's fears. But I also, you know, appreciate uh, uh, Council Member um, Mahan's sort of mentioning of the saturation of this particular area. Uh, obviously, the idea of establishing the safe parking site was done with that, you know, recognizing that that existed. So I'm okay with that generally. But I do think that uh, we consistently hear from our residents that are on both in District 2 and District 10 about the saturation of this particular uh, area, given that we have the Rue Ferrari site, the Brunel site, obviously we have Branham uh, Monterey, Road, Monterey Road site not too far from there uh, as well. And so I appreciate all that. And I was actually considering signing on to the memo, Council May, 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 Councilmember Mahan, as you well know. One of the reasons I didn't was I was obviously interested in waiting to hear back on the 29th. So I appreciate the clarification you shared. Uh, I'm also interested in waiting to hear back uh, simply to, to figure out whether staff thinks that some of what's in the memo is, is, is going to be doable, quite frankly. And so I look forward to that conversation on the 29th. But, but, but I would just raise something that maybe <laughs> struck me as very concerning. And, and Jackie, if you can come back up, please. Uh, I, I, I <clears throat> and as you come up, let me just give you a little bit of context. So the idea of this location was really, it, it was conceived because we were consistently hearing a lot of concerns from residents about RVs parking uh, in areas around this, this not immediately around this area, but in the surrounding radius. Um, and so that was the reason that my uh, office uh, stepped forward with, with this idea. Um, Jackie, I heard you say to Councilmember Cohen's question about this site being, I'm not trying to remember exactly how you said it, but being primarily for the folks from Columbus Park, is that? Yes, we are going to be relocating people that are currently in Columbus Park into this particular site, but there are 45 spaces and we do not anticipate that all of those spaces will be used by the Columbus Park people who are waiting for a relocation. Right, so, so, so that, that's troubling to me. I mean, it's obviously, I understand that we're in the process of what well, we need to find a location for many of those RVs at Columbus Park to go. I recognize that, that's super important. I I just feel like that goes contrary to what I've been telling residents from the very, uh, when, when this idea initially emerged, uh, part of one of the callers, I think, <laughs> uh, was part of some of the folks in the community sort of suggesting to the residents that this, this, RV, this RV safe parking site was going to be explicitly and only for folks uh, from Columbus Park. I know that's not what you said. It's going to, uh, but, but what my concern is, is this. I don't know how many RVs are at Columbus Park. Do we know, have a general sense? I think 100 or so or nine? No, not that many. It's reduce, producing. I think okay. we're in the uh, 50s or so. Okay. But if I could just say from Columbus Park, there's 15 RVs that would go to the Santa Teresa VTA site. How do we know that there is so out of those 50 ish that only 15 would go there? How is um, sure we've been working very extensively with the individuals in Columbus Park to find for them the best housing option for them. Many of them are already in the queue for permanent supportive housing or rapid rehousing or they've chosen to go to one of the city's interim sites. So. Um, that's how we got to the 15. Those are the households that are interested and qualify for safe parking. Okay, so so obviously that'll leave a good amount uh, for for I guess a, a radius or sort of uh, places around the the safe park location. Um, I guess. And can I, I just, just say <clears> the <throat> please the the preference order is geographical preference first priority referrals from other encampments, which in this case would be Guadalupe Gardens as the second 
that's that's the order that we would go in. So so this side opens up, we had 40, 45 uh, parking spots. What you're saying is the order in which those 45 are filled is Columbus and then Guadalupe and then? Sorry, Columbus and Guadalupe are the same thing. Uh, oh, okay. So okay. the priority is local preference, Guadalupe Gardens slash Columbus Park. Okay. And what we're trying to balance, council member, is that direction from February of 2022 um, in a mayor from the mayor and a few others about prioritizing an RV safe parking for people from Guadalupe Gardens. So we're we're trying to balance this um, sort of conf <laughs> this bit of conflicting um, direction where our standard practice is that local preference first for safe parking, for overnight warming locations, for EIHs, all of our emergency response programs have that geographic preference as first priority. Okay. And, and so can you, can you remind me how that geographic preference sort of takes shape? Is it a matter of just outreach in the immediate area? I know that's part of the memo that was in Councilman Romain. Yeah, so it's outreach in the immediate area, but we also, uh, listen to the council offices and community members about helping us identify sort of where the hot spots are. Okay. So, for example, last year when we were opening an OWL in District 8, we worked very closely with the council office and the community advisory committee to identify where street outreach should be going to invite people into that OWL. Okay, and, and, and I think, you know, thinking back to some of those other meetings in which we discussed Columbus Park, I remember asking explicitly, very openly in a, during a council meeting, I'm not sure if it was to council member or vice mayor Jones or council member Mahan, but asking, is your intent to move the folks from Columbus Park to the safe parking? And the answer was no. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, I guess I haven't heard that very explicitly expressed by the council, but, uh, and I'll just say this, and just to conclude, is that um, my concern is this, and I think the, the, the residents rightly have a concern as well, uh, and so I'll just log this with them, is, is that, um, that we open up the site, that we welcome all these RVs from Columbus Park, which generally is the right thing to do, you know, finding a spot for them, I acknowledge that. But if we don't, if we're opening up this location and the residents in the area don't see a decrease in RVs in their respective neighborhoods that I essentially told them that was the point of this, then I think we, we, we have a challenge there, right? Because we're, we're, we're saying we're gonna do this, we're doing, we're doing X, then we do Y, and then I think that erodes our credibility with the residents that we wanna get on board to help support some of these. And so I just wanted to put that out there. Um, Let me just add, so again, because not all these spots would be taken up you know, there will be a, a minimum of these 30 slots that for sure that we will actively try to recruit people to come in to the actual facility. And, you know, the challenge will always be, as we've opened up other facilities uh, when we did car parking before, you know, sometimes people have specific connections to uh, very specific spots, whether it's a family member in the area that's helping them or a school where their kids are going. And so we just have to be mindful that people have all kinds of reasons why they decide to move to a particular area and when they don't, even when something that appears to us makes a lot of sense, doesn't necessarily work for the individual household that's living wherever they're at. But we always make a very strong concerted targeted effort when we open up these facilities to invite people in because it, frankly it does make the most sense that people are most likely to come into a facility like that if they are close to it they already have connections and so it is the most it's usually the most viable solution and we've seen it work council council member <clears throat> excuse me omar peasants the city manager's office the one thing i would mention about the memos that are coming back on the 29th, one of your uh, comments, I, I think we hear a lot this, um, we're letting folks know, hey, we're opening this because we want to uh, decrease in, uh, the, the visibility on the street, give people a safe place to go. One of the things that's in that memo on the 29th is how to ad address understanding the scope 
so that when you're telling your constituents, hey, we're going to decrease the need, you know, if we're talking about hundreds of items of need, what the impact of 45 might be, for example. So that's a direction that I think your council was smart to direct us to come back with. And that's part of what we'll be weighing in on. What are the needs? What is the scope so that we have a, a holistic systemic approach? Okay. Well, yeah, I, I've logged my concern. I, I just, I'll, I'll wait to, you know, on the 29th and see what, what, what you all bring forward as it relates to, you know, evaluating, you know, the path forward a little bit more clearly. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mahan. Yeah, thanks, Vice Mayor. I appreciate the clarifying questions from Councilmember Jimenez. I, I'm getting a little bit of whiplash here just because we were at a community meeting where residents asked, so is this a site for RVs in the area or for from Guadalupe Gardens? And the, the response from staff from the housing department was clear that the priority was very much the surrounding neighborhood. So I think we just, we need to be very clear about how we communicate and the expectations that we set with residents. I also don't quite understand why it would be our standard practice we always follow to focus on outreach in the immediate vicinity, but then to not want to talk about putting any parameters around that for this program. I, I also want to just note that in the memo, at least as I've written it, these are just suggestions for a 30-day period, for a radius that to be specified in the future. The, the two miles is just a for example. There's no direction here around it should be two miles. In fact, my hope would be that staff would come back to us in the future and say, we think the following distance is feasible because here's roughly how many RVs are within that radius, right? So there's meant to be flexibility in at least what I've written. Also on the, on the point about residents' concerns, I, I'm not sure it's a great approach for us to simply tell them they're wrong. I think they're entitled to have their fears. I think the memo makes clear that they may very well be wrong in those fears. I've been on the receiving end of many of those complaints and concerns in community meetings, but I don't think we should just tell them we're wrong. I think we should talk about what we're gonna to do to make sure that their neighborhood is, uh, is, is better, not worse off for taking on part of the solution. So anyway, I very much stand by what I've written here. I don't care whose memo gets passed. I guess my question, Omar, is, when we come back on the 29th, will we, will staff be in a position to comment on the feasibility of doing outreach within a certain radius to prioritize first, as we told the community repeatedly, that we will be focused on relocating RVs in the immediate vicinity into the safe park site? Trying to tease out the layers of that, that question. So on the 29th, okay. as we've told the community in multiple meetings, will we be in a position to talk about the feasibility of focusing first on relocating RVs from the surrounding area. Again, I don't care what the radius is. You all might say it should be a half mile, a mile. It doesn't matter to me. We don't have to take out a tape measure or anything, but we've told the community over and over again, starting with the initiation of this site from the previous council member whose district it was in, that this was a solution for RVs in the area first and foremost. So are we, on the 29th, going to be able to talk about how we will implement that and be able to prioritize relocating RVs from the neighborhood into this site? So there's sort of two, you, you mentioned both talking about the implementing the notion of an immediate outreach. And I think, the, I don't want to put words in the housing department's uh, mouth, but they're here. I think that part of it is part of the housing department's current policy. And so we'll be uh, uh, lifting that up in that conversation. The question- What's the distance on that policy? How far out do we do outreach for an RV safe park site? Uh, I will let Reagan come back down, but what I heard her say is that we often coordinate with the local offices to find out if there are key areas in your district that are close to the site that we should be reaching, you know, outreaching to, to invite into a facility. But now that Reagan has come back down, I will have her answer that more specifically. Hi, Reagan Henninger with the housing department. There's no, <laughs> defined radius council member it really varies by the site and by the feedback we hear from the council office and the neighbors okay and but we can guarantee the community there's there's no time frame for which we are prioritizing rvs in the area first or is there do we do we start with outreach in the neighborhood and if so for how long 
Yeah, typically for any emergency response program, whether it's an overnight warming location, a safe parking location, an interim housing location, we start the outreach three to six months before a site is opening. Um, and it's proactive prior to a site opening. We don't have the resources to continue that proactive outreach. So after a site opens, the outreach then is more reactive. Um, if we hear from a council member or neighborhood that there's an, our, a lived-in vehicle right. or an encampment, we'll go out. And do we, uh, do we know when this site is likely to open? If we pass this today? January. Okay. And have we done the outreach and have identified the RVs on the street that we'll be trying to relocate in January? Yes, we have started. Okay. Um, how many RVs have we found in the area? Do we know? I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. So it sounds like the outreach piece is part of the program. We haven't codified what it really looks like, but we're going to tell the community we're going to make good on that promise we made them. And then on the 29th, when we talk more holistically about RVs, will we be talking about the circumstances under which we would we would do abatement yeah i uh, councilmember mayhan what we're going to bring back uh, the the short answer is we're going to bring back all of the detail that you as the elected body has to make a decision about how you want to approach that whether that approach is uh, abating and what that would involve whether you want enhanced services which we're also in. so all of those things we're, we're really trying to bring back enough information for for the council to make a decision about how it wants to go forward so, so that's yeah. I'm just trying to be specific because I'm trying to figure out here if I if I should be fighting harder for my memo or just letting it go because I want to make sure on the 29th we have a productive conversation. That's that's all I'm trying to get to. Yeah, and I think and, and Jackie, feel free to chime in. I think that the answer to the question, the specific answer to the question, is you'll be able to see like what what is the impact of, of varying um, choices about distances around this abatement kind of question. Okay. Be bear right. in mind, uh, just useful for everyone to be aware that, that, that also some of the pieces that you're describing, uh, like for example, relocating a vehicle that somebody is living in or an abandoned vehicle, those involve some additional layers that we'll also talk about at that time. That, Great. That, that are just, just so you're, you have that. Yeah, whole, no, it's yeah. super complicated. I'm, I'm not necessarily arguing for the outcome. I just want to make sure that this is included in the conversation we're going to have on the 29th. Right. And, and the one point of clarification that I'd like to make, council member, is that, I, you know, we, the housing department has chosen to be flexible regarding, you know, the areas in which we will invite people in given the work that we do with each individual council office when we open projects up. And so one of the things I just want to make sure you're hearing is that if, you know, if there are uh, encampments or RVs, actually RVs in your area that you would like us to look into specifically, if you could please communicate those so that we can begin that outreach and begin identifying those vehicles. And I think, you know, you, the policy decision you would want to make, I guess, is do you want to have a very specific rule that says, okay, you're going to do the outreach half mile and that's it? Or do you want to have more flexibility, which is how we have chosen to implement and really work with each individual office to really work in partnership and identifying what are the encampments or the RVs that you think you know, you, you, you know your neighborhood the best and your residents know them the best. And, and we absolutely want these facilities to be addressing the needs within those communities where, that are touched by them. Yeah, thanks, Jake. I, that makes sense. And I, I think the flexibility may make perfect sense and be exactly where we want to be. I just want to make sure that we are specific enough with the community that they understand concretely what we're doing to take care of their neighborhood. And I've heard in community meetings, oh, yeah, we're focusing on getting RVs out of your neighborhood. But then your first answer today was like, well, actually, we're focused on moving Guadalupe. I think we clarified that. But I just I think the more that we can come to the community with a very clear action plan that says these are the steps we're taking. Here's what we're doing. We're going to spend three months doing outreach. We're going to look at least if we don't want to give a distance, fine. I think the more concrete we can make it feel, the more buy in we're going to get. I mean, this came out of a conversation in a community center with 50 very angry people. 
who are consistently asking us, well, what happens if an RV shows up and we tell them no? Are they going to just park right in front of the site? And I think we need to be able to answer that, right? <laughs> That's all I'm looking for. I, I don't mean to dictate, oh, it should be two miles or a thousand feet. Those were just examples. I think we just need to be able to build trust and give them confidence that we're going to implement this in a way that actually is a win-win for everybody. That's, that's all I'm going for here. So I'm, I'm fine with the motion on the floor. It sounds like we're going to be talking about much of this on the 29th. So that's great. Thank you, Councilmember Davis. Thank you. I want to thank staff for all their work in getting this first RV site off the ground. I know that uh, having an agreement with BTA is not easy, and that's why we haven't had this come to us yet um, since before. I also want to thank my staff and colleagues for the discussion, the robust discussion today, and a reminder that the purpose of this site is a dual purpose, like all of our sites. Um, I have found that to be to be the case in all of the sites in my district as well. And I want to thank Councilmember Mahan for agreeing with me and lifting up what I've been saying all along, which is that all of the sites that we have that that provide a homeless solution need to be make that make the neighborhood better off and net positive. And that's what I've been working towards for all the sites in my district, which is why we have a community advisory committee for every every single site. And that really is where the details get worked out, Council Member Mahan, and where the trust comes in with the neighborhood and where all of the implementation gets worked out. I don't think it's appropriate to have discussions about specific implementation details here on the dais with all of us when you don't need a memo to do it. We just work it out, as Jackie has been talking about, in our CAC meetings with the council and the, the council member and the community. You don't need to work out those details here. So it can be a collaborative and it should be a collaborative process with the neighbors, the staff, the service providers, the um, property management, and then eventually once the site opens with the people who live on the site as well. That's how it has worked multiple times in my district. And I highly recommend that that is how it should work on the site in your district as well. It's really important to reach out to residents nearby certainly but obviously i don't think it's practical to have every site be exclusive um, especially if we're going to put a radius in place it wouldn't <laughs> then it becomes a moot a moot issue um, and then what do we do? we do do we close down the site as people attract out i don't that doesn't make sense to me um, and i did want to ask since nobody has actually asked you about the radius uh two miles half mile anything in between a thousand feet what is the likelihood of being able to have this radius and to enforce any kind of non-encampment zones and if you want to defer that until the end of the month you're welcome to but nobody's actually asked you that yet i appreciate that uh omar passons the city manager's office i appreciate that uh last deferral note i, I think it's important it's not just it's not about punting it's that we're we're really going to lay out multiple scenarios for you to, to to really take in on that day and so i think it'll make sense for you to have the whole context the sort of cost related questions the oper the system operational impacts we want to want you to have all that so you can make the decisions that, that you think work best for people who are unhoused for com other community members etc so if we could come back with that on the 29th that would be great yeah thank you and i appreciate being able to see all of the trade-offs for what if we're going to have these what they would look like and if we are able to implement them in not just for one site, but for all of our sites and what that might what that might look like and what that might cost and whether there's any kind of phase in that we would have to do for that. And it's, it's a good point, Councilmember Davis, because several districts have many emergency um, options, emerging emergency shelter options already in their districts before the EIH and BHE program began. And so part of having the whole conversation is being able to, to make sure all of those districts as a, as a whole city are part of the conversation. I'm sure that's something that you've, you've experienced. So we'll just make sure to really try to be thorough for all, all of you and for the public when we come back. Thank you, I appreciate that. And it would also be helpful to know if we're including sites that are not necessarily run by the city because we have sites in my district, at least one, and I think we have two that are run by the county.
I wasn't sure if that was a question. Yes, uh, sorry. <laughs> Not a question, just yeah, okay. a suggestion okay. that we we also include the possibility of that yeah. um, because there are there are more than just city run sites in some of our districts. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I think together with the housing department pulling together, there's a housing inventory count that lays out these emergency options. And so we really work in coordination with a, to, to do to make sure we get all the information or as best we can. Thank you. Councilmember Cohen, you may or may not have the last word on this topic. I don't need the last word. I just have a couple more comments. <laughs> I, um, I, I just wanted to make a few comments because, you know, we're dealing with, with we've been dealing with this issue for a while, and we're, we're far away from getting to the point at which we have a holistic solution. And I hope we get to the point where we can make promises. But we know from our experience, even with just the general unhoused situation, that we had, you know, we talk about having housed 10,000 people, but yet, even more people have become unhoused. And so it's an unfortunate reality that we're working under right now, that, that for us to be able to make any assurances that a site is going to clearly make a, a noticeable decrease is a very difficult thing to do until we reach a critical mass of sites. And that's why I'm pushing, and I think many of us would like to see as many sites as possible. Of course, it's a question of funding and staff time and, a lot, and finding sites, which is exceptionally difficult. Um, but, but I... I I agree, certainly, that we shouldn't be dismissing concerns of the community, and we need to be um, uh, aware of them and also acknowledge them. But at the same time, we also need to be honest with the community about the realities of, some, of the situation and let people know that um, these sites are beneficial to all because it gets a number of people off the streets. And that's why last week at the Rules Committee, we talked about specifically for each of the I'm, I'm going to insist in the ones in my district, but I hope for all of our community meetings going forward, we will have people who have actually lived on these sites at those meetings to say, hey, uh, this is how it benefited me. This is the service we got there. This is what it was like. Um, so the people that are in the community will actually be able to see this is not necessarily what they think, what they expect. And I think it's important for us to be able to, to bring that kind of lived experience to the community um, to, to make... Um, you know, so people can understand better what it is that we're dealing with. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. We we had a we had a situation in Coyote Creek in our in our area where we we the, the neighborhood there was a big issue with a lot of people living by a neighborhood. It was causing problems in the neighborhood. We abated that site. It was a difficult decision to make to abate the site. Now people are beginning to move back in, and you know we can't continue to abate and abate and abate until we have enough sites for everybody. Um, and it and it, it's an unfortunate reality that we have to be honest with our community to say. This is what happens when we try to keep people out. But we have to have enough places to offer to people. Um, so I don't know if you want to make a comment about that. Well, the one thing I just, that made me think about the comment of, wouldn't it be great to have people with lived experience talk about kind of the benefits that they've received from these facilities, I think is a great idea. And the only thing I would caution you with is, I think Council Member Mahan or Jimenez mentioned the 50 angry people in the meeting. And so to put somebody who still can be very vulnerable talking about a very personal experience in their life and to have angry people responding, you know, and given the political discourse that we can currently see in our very own community, that's a lot to ask an, an individual to go through. It's hard enough sometimes for staff to hear it. Um, and so I just would caution you, well, Sometimes we'd like to do that, and we've thought of doing it. Sometimes, like the, it's really hard on an individual to tell their story and still hear kind of the m misunderstandings, the lack of information about what people's lives are. Yeah, I appreciate that. And let's let's let we can discuss alternatives such as videos or uh, or Zoom or other kinds of appearances that will make it more as comfortable as we can make it for people who can offer that perspective. We, you know, we did pass a policy last year to, to create a 150 foot zone around schools, for example, right? We've learned, I think, from that, that people count 152 feet and live just outside that zone. It's also was, un, was I was a little nervous about that policy because we, I think we have people who may, may find a site that's actually potentially less visible and less on the direct path of where students are going and then they end up in a more prominent place because we've said this is within a certain radius. So I think arbitrary 
specific definitions sometimes might not necessarily work as, as planned. So I think we just have to be careful when we start talking about those numbers. Um, as I said before, as I was worried about with the school one, we're saying we don't want kids who walk to school to have to go past somebody, so we have to keep the school area clean. But when they move into the neighborhood where the students live and they see them even more frequently. So I, I'm just concerned that until we have the resources to house everyone, that we're beginning to have conversations about how to abate. And what that'll do is concentrate people into smaller areas of the city and isn't necessarily solving the problem. Um, and, and I'll just go back to the example I have on Cruz Drive in North San Jose. We have businesses who are telling us they're ready to leave the city. It's obviously, obviously true that we put a lot of effort into where people live in their homes, but what ends up happening is people are getting concentrated into parts of the city where people, where we're not going to put our effort into abating because we don't have homeowners that are upset, but we have safety issues at, around businesses um, and we have other things that occur as a result of this, this moving people from certain kinds of places that we're protecting to other places. And so th there's so many considerations here that I think we have to be really careful about being over prescriptive. And that's kind of what I'm worried about. I think the goal here is to provide as many services as possible to get as many people into safe conditions, help make their vehicles operational and put them in a place where they can be successful. And that's why I hope that we'll have a good holistic discussion on the 29th. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, and that does look like the last word. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, so, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Thank you. We are now on to open forum. Claire Beekman? Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, in this uh, election day, I wanted to bring up uh, the concept that uh, I think we're feeling a little uncomfortable with how the county executive was re uh, uh, reelected or not reelected, but was uh, a new uh, a new county executive was was elected to the post for Santa Clara County without a bit more uh, public comment uh, or, or consent. Uh, and um, it brought up to me a few issues in Santa Clara County. They do not know how to uh, offer on their closed meeting agendas any sort of public uh, dialogue that they, what was take or what will take place or what is taking place in their closed meeting agendas uh, or closed meeting sessions. They really need to do that. Most barrier cities do that. I don't understand why Santa Clara County has not. Claire, can you keep it to topics related to the city? Topics well, topics? yes, okay. And so uh, I, I, I am, I'm coming to that. Um, you know, uh, so I, I think it's, it's matters that ba as barrier, other barrier cities do these things, uh, there's sort of a, a need to, an urgency to, an importance to. Now in San Jose, we are not addressing, you have closed session items uh, and, and city manager reports uh, and, and city attorney reports each week that you specifically make sure that there is not public comment allowed on those items where the Brown Act specifically states that there is public comment allowed on those items. Now there's a, there's a problem here. And I think in the, into the next mayoral administration, you're going to have to figure out ways to, to allow public comment for those times. And I've, I've offered you several times, several simple, easy solutions to that and ways to work on it. Uh, let's hope we can. And uh, thanks for your time. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, next week, there's gonna be a county meeting to demolish City Hall. Okay, so I want all you social justice warriors to talk a lot of smack. We need to preserve City Hall. City Hall is a civil rights museum. That's what I'm going to make sure that that becomes. The old San Jose City Hall needs to become a civil rights museum. Why? Number one, Janet Gray Hayes, first mayor of San Jose, uh, first mayor of a major city in the United States. Number two, Norman Mineta, the first Asian mayor. Number three, Al Garza, the first Chicano mayor to hold a position in San Jose. Number four, Ron Gonzalez was the first Mexican mayor since 1846. 
that needs to be preserved as a historical landmark and a civil rights museum. I'm going to make sure that I get the Normaneta people on there because that's where he served. We got airports named after him. Why not preserve the space and the place where he governed? Okay, that's number one. Number two, once again, historical landmark status. Paul Soto, Sacred Heart Church, now a historical landmark. The first building to produce the first issue of Lowrider Magazine, now a historical landmark. Why? Because of Paul Soto's work in this city. I love my city, and I love my barrio because both of those places and spaces are in the barrio where I grew up. What a privilege, what an honor to serve my city in such ways. So uh, go Mayhan. I voted for Mayhan and Esparza. I got expectations. Expectations. Go Mayhan. Bye. Hold on. Cindy? Cindy Falk here. The San Jose Police requires our respect. There's a little park across from the Cambrian Library that is dedicated to a fallen San Jose police officer. This park is for little children. It has a 25-foot sandbox, a playground, a lawn, and a service road. There are no picnic tables or field for sports. Homeless often camp at the rear of the park. Abatement is a long, drawn-out process taking months and thus accumulating garbage and grocery carts. This isn't acceptable in a memorial park. With the city's need for a good, full police force, we should be doing everything possible to show our respect of our police force and keeping this park free from homeless campers should be included. Delaying abatements, claiming it does not meet the requirements of blocking public access or in a walking pathway of school children is not acceptable. I find it unacceptable that a park dedicated to a fallen San Jose police officer can be easily brushed aside. The city has asked for changes in police behavior, and it's time for the city to change its behavior and keep this park clear of encampments. Thank you. Caller 6910. I guess it's a, <clears throat> I guess it's a really good time to mention how many unhoused people have been abused and assaulted by police. Just seems like a good time to point that out after the last call. Um, I just really wanted to uh, appreciate publicly uh, Council Member Cohen's last remarks. And I really wanted to question the buffer zones. I think it's time to um, maybe come up with a different strategy with the buffer zones, maybe a layering system of the buffer zones. Um, is, is the, should there be a 150 foot buffer zone around a daycare where parents just drop off children and there aren't children walking back and forth. The buffer zones have stigmatized unhoused people as dangerous and, you know, you can't have your children around them and all those comments of my children shouldn't have to see that. If you stick with the idea of children walking by, then daycare centers do not qualify. Maybe we should come up with a system where it's, you know, children over a certain age and have a buffer zone around that area and not younger children, like buff where parents are just dropping off children behind closed doors. Because otherwise you are going to push people farther and farther into more concentrated areas. And eventually people are just gonna be lining the freeways and lining the middle of the street because that's all that's going to be left to them. And that's why more and more people are dying in traffic fatalities because they're being pushed more, more and more towards areas where there's vehicles instead of being in areas that were safer and where there was slower traffic. So when you look at why are more people getting hit because they're being pushed into areas where there's higher um, traffic. Jill? Caller 6910. Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders. I'm calling from District 10, but th today I wanted to during open forum, um, express my thanks to a council member Foley this year. Um, during November, I have a tradition of giving thanks publicly and privately to those people that really made a difference personally to me. And council member Foley and her staff put
put on the most amazing community event. Um, and I, I feel so bad. I think it was called Music in the Park. I apologize if that's not it. But where all the schools came and all the different bands from all the different schools around the area performed. And I laid out my blanket in the middle of two stages and listened to her introduce one band and then introduce the next band and so forth. And it was one of the most wholesome, um, inspiring, motivating, just, and I, I guess the word is healing is, is really what I want to thank Council Member Foley and her staff for because after the pandemic and finally having that space where we were able to sit down and listen to music and listen to these kids be proud of themselves and I could hear parents super excited and pointing out their child on a stage and I just wanted to say today that that one event gave me so much um, such a feeling of hope in San Jose and that's what I'm looking for I'm looking for you know there's so much despair and we have to find these points we have to keep helping each other but find these high points magnify them and try to do them again and so thank you thank you thank you it was healing it was beautiful it was probably a top top in my top three days this year um that made me feel like you know the world's a good place and so thank you very much for putting that on um, and to your staff for helping with it it really made a difference for me thank you back to the council thank you this meeting is adjourned <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs>